Hello, and welcome to the Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter. Today, we're talking about The Birth of Tragedy by Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche, famous philosopher, right? very influential. Uh, some of his most famous works include The Gay Science, for instance. The Gay Science includes that famous quote, God is dead, right? The whole notion that man no longer needs religion to find truth, that we must free ourselves from the bonds of religion to find meaning, right? Or even his probably his most famous work is Thus Spoke Zarathustra, right? The pilgrimage, the quest to achieve the Oberman status or the Superman status, however you want to say it. Um, a quest to liberate yourself from all confines of what society tells you you should do and just find your own truth, your own meaning, right? That's what Zarathustra is about. Also, you know, another famous work from Nietzsche, Beyond Good and Evil. You know, I'm just throwing out these very influential, very popular works. So much even pop culture, movies, and, you know, even video games have been inspired by these things. But we're talking about a lesser known work, his first work. And I don't know if this is lesser known. Maybe it's very popular, I'm not sure. But uh, I know that this is his first work, uh, The Birth of Tragedy. And I wanted to read it because I want, I think this book is good because it gives you a great uh, frame of reference, uh, kind of a starting point, a foundation to where Nietzsche's coming from. Because this, he wrote this when he was young and you know he was trying to change the world his whole life he was trying to change the world trying to get people to think differently about things and you could definitely see the passion and the determination to sway the reader towards some sort of new epiphany of thought you know you could already start reading that in the birth of tragedy and it provides a great reference point that you know an understanding of where nietzsche is first trying to come from since it is his first work, it is not without its flaws. Um, it is definitely criticized. I mean, the book actually opens with a criticism of Nietzsche himself. He re-released the work years later and he <laughs> prefaces it with a criticism that he made himself. Talking about how, you know, he felt like he had a purpose or he really wanted to talk about something, but, you know, he didn't really provide that much evidence <laughs> to what he's uh, saying. And that's pretty much the criticism that Introduction talks about too. That's what I got. Uh, the, the birth of tragedy makes a lot of claims, but it doesn't really provide that much like backup or evidence. You know, when you go to school, you learn about writing essays and you, you know, you learn about doing research and uh, using citations to back up your claims and make your argument strong. It's not a lot of that in this book. It's just like his idea, this is what I think, this is why it's good. This is why you should listen to what I have to say. <laughs> but despite that, it is, you know, he does have some good points. You know, if you just kind of read it without focusing on the whole essay format, if, if you just take the messages from this book and just think about them, mull them over in your head, uh, I think it is a very good uh, read. And there's definitely some good points you can get from it. So in the book, The Birth of Tragedy, you know, the title says it all. It talks about how the art form of the tragedy started. Even today, right? The most powerful stories, the blockbuster movie hits, most popular novels, they're really tragedies. They're about this hero that has to go through all these problems, this suffering and uh, this hardship, and then he achieves or he, she achieves a goal and sometimes it doesn't work out in the end for the hero, but what they achieve to benefits the world. You know, it's a very, very popular notion. Nietzsche starts off talking about how the Greeks in, uh, pretty much invented that whole way of storytelling and it survived to this day. Another big part of this book, the message behind this book is the importance of the arts. And Nietzsche talks about arts in two different ways. He calls the art of beauty and order the Apolline, based off of the story of the myth of Apollo. The Apolline is more about paintings and sculptures, and Nietzsche refers to it as plastic art, like tangible items. Then he also talks about what's called the Dionysiac, based off of the Greek god Dionysius. And that art is more primal, that art is more ecstatic, it's more uh, instinctive. Nietzsche talks about how this 
art, the Dionysiac, that's, that's basically music in his mind. So he puts the Dionysiac above the Alpaline. What Nietzsche is saying here in this work is that art is the means by which we derive meaning from life and the Dionysiac side of art, music, is the epitome of that art. We can find the most meaning from the music. He also states that by using the Apolline as a tool or means to achieve the Dionysiac, uh, we can find the true meaning in life. So in the arts, you want to use the Apolline and the Dionysiac in tangent with each other, but the Apolline is always subordinate to the Dionysiac, which is the epitome, the highest form of art. Let's check out a quote from the book that describes how Nietzsche thinks you should apply the Apolline art form and the Dionysiac art form via tragedy. He beholds the transfigured world of the stage and yet denies it. He sees the tragic hero before him in epic clarity and beauty and yet rejoices in his destruction. He understands the dramatic events to their very depths, yet he is happy to escape into incomprehension. He feels that the hero's acts are justified yet is all the more uplifted when those acts destroy their originator. He trembles at the sufferings which will befall the hero, and yet they give him a higher, much more powerful pleasure. He looks more keenly, more deeply than ever, and yet wishes for blindness. How do we account for this marvelous schism within the cell, this blunting of the Apolline point, if not with reference to the Dionysiac magic, which, while appearing to raise Apolline emotions to their highest level, can still harness this exuberance of Apolline power into its own service. We can understand the tragic myth only as a visualization of Dionysiac wisdom by means of Apolline artifices. It takes the world of phenomena to its limits where it denies itself and seeks to escape back to the womb of the soul true reality. That pretty much sums it up <laughs> in terms of, uh, well, it doesn't sum it up, but it gives a, uh, it's kind of like a thesis statement, but not so a thesis statement. It's definitely a main point of the book, how the tragedy is used to express the highest form of humanity, which in Nietzsche's mind is art. The art is expressing those two concepts, the Apolline and the Dionysiac. And in this way, we express the tragedy, which in his mind is an apex when it comes to meaning in life. So really this, this book is all about how the Greeks are so great and so amazing because they put art at its highest form. And you know, the Greeks are pretty cool. I mean, you know, they, I mean, they've done some bad stuff too, but I mean, they're cool for that. They did hold art at its highest level and Nietzsche just constantly uh, praises that society for what they've done and how art was the um, center of that society and how great they were and how they started uh, this amazing storytelling method of the tragedy and how great that was and you know I mean that's that was, that was definitely a, a lot of the book so the book goes on like that for a while and then it, it starts getting good kind of in the middle when Nietzsche starts attacking Socrates <laughs> Uh, that's what it kind of sparked my interest a lot more. <laughs> In my mind, I'm like, whoa, really? You gotta take on Socrates? You gotta criticize him? <laughs> the, pretty much the one of the fathers of Western philosophy, if not the father of Western philosophy. <laughs> you gotta attack him? And, but that's Nietzsche. Nietzsche is, he, is no holds barred with Nietzsche. He attacks Socrates. He goes on later in other works to attack religion. <laughs> I mean, it's just no holds barred with this man. He talks about how Socrates put logic and reason uh, above art. And he did that through language, through dialectics, through dialogue. Um, his sole purpose was to reach the truth, which he felt was that that's meaning to him. Truth, uh, Socrates I'm talking about. And by doing that, you converse through dialogue, dialectics, and you do that in a logical, in a way based off of reason. Nietzsche feels that that whole emphasis on logic pushed art aside, and it became detrimental to society. Once Socrates died and his followers, people like Plato and Aristotle, promoted that whole type of thinking, art went the way of the sidelines, and logic took its place. And Nietzsche has a problem with that. 
Yeah, because Nietzsche believes art is the primary way we find meaning. So let me read a quote so you can get an understanding what Nietzsche thinks about Socrates. But the most accurate statement about this radical new admiration for knowledge and insight came from Socrates, when he found that he alone admitted to himself that he knew nothing, while on his critical wanderings throughout Athens, addressing the greatest statesmen, rhetoricians, poets, and artists, he encountered only the simulation of knowledge. He was astonished to realize that all those celebrities were lacking in a correct and secure insight even into their own professions and carried out their work only instinctively. Only instinctively. The phrase touches the very heart and core of the Socratic intention. Socratism used it to depreciate all known art and ethics. Wherever its piercing gaze alighted, it found only a lack of insight and the power of delusion and deduced from this that the prevailing situation was both misguided and reprehensible. Nietzsche blames Socrates for the downfall of art in society. Now, that's not to say that Nietzsche is a pure hater of Socrates. Some people get that mistaken. Nietzsche doesn't hate Socrates. Uh, he respects Socrates for what he's done. He does admit that because he put reason and logic on such a high pedestal that opened the door to the advancement of science and technology because scientists to this day still use elements of the Socratic method to discover scientific advancements. Let me share your quote with you where he uh, admits this. Let us consider how after Socrates, the mystagogue of science waves of philo philosophical schools emerged and vanished one after the other. Our thirst for knowledge Hitherto unimagined throughout the educated world, the true task for everyone of superior intelligence led science onto the high seas from which it has never been entirely banished. How that universality first established a common network of rational thought across the globe, providing glimpses of the lawlessness of an entire solar system. Once we remember this, in the astonishingly high pyramid of knowledge of the present day, we cannot help but see Socrates as the turning point, the vortex of world history. So I guess Nietzsche isn't a Socrates hater, but he is saying that as a result of that, art got pushed to the back burner. And the problem is now that we can't really get meaning in life anymore. Like, what does life really mean if we don't have art? I mean, that's Nietzsche's gripe. Yeah, we got all this science and knowledge and logic, and then none of it is based off of any kind of meaning, which he, Nietzsche feels is art. And to be quite honest with you, he, you know, he has a point, Nietzsche. I mean, he kind of has a point. I mean, think about today. You know, let's think, think about today. Think about how you know the school systems. When you know a lot of schools, most schools, at least in America, at least, uh, we don't really give art uh, the attention that it deserves. Usually, when a question of funding or money is involved, what's the first to go? The art programs, right? Uh, the music programs. Uh, and what's put on priority? Uh, math and science. You know, first is math and science, right? And then what second place we consider the humanities, English and history, right? And then maybe third place is physical education. But on the very last of the total poll, we see art and music. <laughs> That's the first to go always when it comes to a question of okay we don't have enough money what's the first thing we got to cut and it, it is true like we do give art the shaft uh, when it comes to whether it's a choice of either or right but we what well, we have to realize and I think Nietzsche I disagree with Nietzsche uh, at when he says that art is the epitome like that is the most important part of the human experience uh, you know, we gotta understand that it's equal, you know, we need both math, science, logic, reason, and art, and music. I mean, they're all important. Let's think for a moment about the greatest scientific achievements, like, ever. <laughs> I mean, let's think about those for a minute. And I would argue that those uh, achievements use just as much creativity that an artist would use as, as equal to that of... Uh, logic and reason. For example, you know, Sir Isaac Newton, 
he realized the existence of gravity and through that he wanted to express how planets and stars orbit around each other but the, the mathematics in his day didn't exist to be able to express that so Newton invented his own form of mathematics <laughs> calculus but uh, to make your own mathematical branch <laughs> like that 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 not only does that take logic and reason and a, a good mathematical mind it also you got to be very creative <laughs> you know I mean just think about it he created calculus uh, it, I mean that's very creative of the man to do that and I would argue that in a way is artistic <laughs> you know just another very uh, popular example let's take Einstein's realization that time and space are they're not different they're actually one and the same thing and if, because of that realization he was able to develop the theory of relativity right uh, again that was very creative of the man to come up with that realization I mean there was there was logic and there was reason involved but there was also just as much as creativity and quite frankly the uh, the theory of relativity is a beautiful theory it's very um, artistic in its interpretation I mean let's take this to the present day right uh, right now we've just this we've recently discovered what a lot of people call the God particle the the Higgs boson particle right and that was based on a lot of theoretical physics and theoretical physics in general there is a lot of logic there's a lot of reason but there's you know a lot of that theory you got to have an artistic side as well you got to be be creative you have to really use your imagination and come up with an idea and then back it up with logic and reason the most important achievements in science and math are ones that also use a very artistic and uh, creative mind i mean that's really innovation what it re what really is innovation is when you combine logic and reason with uh, creativity and I would argue art. So I see where Nietzsche is coming from. You know, I get where he's what he's saying about how art is very important and it often does get the shaft and we got to remember how important art is. But Nietzsche uh, sometimes he, he discredits logic and reason a little bit too much. Logic and reason is just as important toward meaning and you know Nietzsche is really talk, focusing on the meaning of trying to find meaning in life, right? That's his focus. And I would argue that you can find just as much meaning through logic and reason that you can through art and music. In fact, you kind of you need both. You, you can't separate the two. You're only going to get a portion of life's meaning through either art or logic. I mean, you need both. You got to merge the two to get a full picture of what the human experience means. I look forward to covering future works of Nietzsche in, on the Black Ponder. <laughs> it's going to be fun. I think I'm going to be disagreeing with a lot of his things as well as agreeing with a lot of these things. Uh, I like the man. I really do. <laughs> uh, I like his fighting spirit. I like how he goes against the status quo. You know, I got to give it up to the man. You know, he, he's, he's standing up for what he believes in and he's very passionate about that. And he's all about trying to find the meaning behind things which you know that's what we're all that's what the black ponder is all about too it's got to be interesting anyway check out the birth of tragedy it's Nietzsche's first published book and it's a good frame of reference or a good starting point it gives you a good foundation to where Nietzsche is first coming from by the way this is the uh, you know penguin classics edition look at that cool picture Woo! <laughs> you got stars and planets and such it comes from this quote let us turn our eyes to the highest spheres of the world that flows around us Ooh, don't you like it i like it it's beautiful that's why i got it i was like oh that looked pretty i gotta get that <laughs> but nietzsche his ideas are pretty too and i look forward to checking him out more this is the black ponder i'm neil trotter see you next time